Okay, everybody. Welcome, Susie. Uh, Susie Sapola. I hope I'm saying your last name correctly. That's right. Okay. Well, Susie is a former physiotherapist, um, and uh, she put her art in the back burner while she studied for her physio degree and pursued her career in physiotherapy. Took an art class during this time and fell in love with creating art again and is no longer a physiotherapist, but a full-time artist in her beautiful Pemberton studio. Um, the thing I love about your art, Susie, is the vast array of subject matter that you paint, everything from the sea, the landscape, cars, animals, abstracts. Your abstracts are lovely. So um, Susie also has her sig senior signature status with the FCA and um, holds lots of workshops, not during COVID, but keep an eye out for any workshops from Susie. And she was mentored by a, a fellow by the name of Brian Ateo, who is a fabulous artist that I think is also worth looking up and you might even talk about him tonight, Susie. But um, anyways, we'll get going. Thank you very much. Over to you, Susie. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, just a quick background on that. Yeah, I was a physio for 30 years and a business owner. So I've taken a lot of my business stuff into, into the painting uh, world, which is kind of cool. Um, I started painting 12 years ago, basically the day I retired and sold my businesses. And um, one of the main reasons was so that I never had any employees. And um, wow, it is so great. And then I, um, I'm a little goal oriented. So I kind of went crazy with uh, trying to get my A and my S and, and I, I work better when I have real solid, solid goals. Um, so what we're going to do today, oh, well, if I talk a little bit about Brian uh, Adio, um, I've been probably the most influenced. Is this volume good? Could be a little higher. Okay, that's as good as it gets. Okay, I'll talk louder. Um, I've been probably primarily or mostly influenced by Brian Adio and uh, the late Robert Ginn. Um, Robert mentored me in the very beginning, very patient man and um, before he passed away. And then I usually have Brian come here every year for three or four weeks in my studio to teach. Oh, what a gift. And, uh, but he is not here this year and he wasn't here last year. So we've taken a two year break. Hopefully it won't be a three year break. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm just gonna show you one way of starting a painting. This is, I don't know, I mix it up all the time. Um, but this is probably the closest to the way I would normally start a painting. Um, Sue talked about my uh, varied subject matter. I think it's because I have a limited attention span. And so I hop from animals to landscapes, to cars, to cats. I mean, just kind of anything, because as we know, everything is just made up of shapes. So it really doesn't matter what it is that you're painting. It's just a whole bunch of shapes. So this morning, I did this little 11 by 14 study of the old car next door. I've painted this a number of times, but I just wanted to uh, whip this off this morning to see whether I could do it so that I don't fail when I do this, start on this one, which is a 30 by 40. So if anybody has any questions, um, I can multitask. So if you want, you can unmute, ask me a question and I will um, answer it as we go along. If you feel like saving it to the end, go ahead. Um, either way, either way is fine. Okay, so with this, the first stage is a bit messy so I, because I'm gonna be wiping and scratching a little bit. So I will often, when I remember, wear, wear gloves for this beginning section. I'm gonna start with um, a two inch uh, Liquitex. I like these little brushes. They don't last though, they tend to fall apart, but while they last, they're pretty good. I've got Thalo Blue, Thalo Green, Quin Magenta, 
and transparent red oxide. Those are my four transparents that I'm gonna use to um, start my value study or my value whatever. Um, I am mixing on a giant sheet of um, plastic uh, vapor barrier, which is I think either four or six mil. So it's pretty, um, it's thick and you can just peel it off once it dries, once it's thick enough, and then you've got a, a clean thing. So I've had this nasty piece of plastic on my table for about six months now, and I just keep peeling the sheets off. Um, this is my reference photo from the little car next door. I've taken about a hundred pictures of it over, well, probably more than that, of with snow, without snow, with sun, with shade, whatever, and I've painted it a, a number of times. So. You be really careful with your phthalo blue because it's so um, powerful. So now that's not uh, pure phthalo. What uh, what is is that a mixture? Yeah, that's a mix of my um, of my four transparents. They're on my on my palette. They're um, like I don't, there, there's a mix on the brush. Like I try not to homogenize the mix on the, on the table. So there's sort of bits of, um, there's bits of it. Um, you can see there's a bit of transparent red oxide. There's quite a, there's a bit too much phthalo in here. That's why I'm getting all this green. Um, so I've got a mix away from the, mix away from the phthalo to get a bit of um, some of the other some of the other colors like this is my palette right there I don't know if you can see that so there's so there's yep. red I'm trying not to homogenize the whole thing in the middle okay I tend to also print out all of my um I spend a fortune on printer ink um and because I, I like to, I like to hold a, uh, a photo in my hand. Um, some people do really well with a iPad, working from an iPad. I don't know, it hurts my neck. I can't seem to, I can't, I can't seem to do it. Okay. I'm trying to be a little bit um, irregular. I don't, I just don't want the whole thing to, um, when I glaze over it later, um, um, I, I, I don't want, I want, I want to have random, I want to have some random things in here. Susie, do you freehand your drawing onto your canvas? Uh, sometimes, um, the one I did this morning, I did this one. Um, I wanted it to be more accurate. So I, I gritted it out, um, and, and, and tried to be as accurate as, as possible. Are you using any glazes in there right now or a medium? Nope. Nope. This is just. Paint. It's just paint and water. Uh, David Longevin would be horrified that I've got water in here. <laughs> um, I always forget that I have um, oh. mediums, mediums to use. Later on, when I go and put glaze layers on, then then I'll use then I'll use medium. And if I want wet and wet. Um, then I'll use the, the stuff. I also have some um, this stuff. If, if you really want this slow drying medium, Windsor Newton, if you want your really to do wet and wet for really a lot longer, so it works a little bit more like uh, oil paint, then this stuff is good. But they Opa stopped carrying it and I can't find it anymore. So this is my last um, 
jar or glass bottle of it. Okay. I've been able to order it from Delta in Edmonton and they'll ship it. Oh, is that right? Ah, okay. Okay, let's see. So basically I'm getting my I'm getting my darks in. But trying to get some a little bit of variety within them so that they're not just just dark dark. There's, there's grass and stuff on the front here. Okay. So Susie, you painted that study you said this morning yep. uh, that you showed us earlier. Uh, what size of a brush would you start a smaller painting like that with? Would it be pretty much the same? No, no, that one I think I probably, I started probably with about a one inch. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, This is just good um, to, to not get super fussy right away by, by using by using this size brush. It forces me to, to get the big um, the big shapes in. Okay, let's see what else. Susie, yep. Um, what is your substrate that you're working on? This? Yes. Uh, that's a deep canvas. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a canvas. You can see it's kind of moving around when I, um, I, 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 if I do abstract stuff, then I like working on um, the cradled wood panel, like that real solid, solid stuff. Okay. So could you just repeat again the four transparent colors you're using, please? Yes, I'm using Quinn Magenta, Transparent Red Oxide, Thalo Green Blue Shade, and Thalo Blue uh, Red Shade. Okay, thanks. Uh, the Thalo Blue um, Green Shade is real, gets really yellowy, like I don't, so I don't use that. Okay, let's see. I think that's going to be mostly it for darks. I think I'll get a slightly smaller brush. And pick up whatever I missed. Sure, what's going on there? What's going on there? Okay. Um, Thank you. 
little yet. You'll get to paint or witness the fastest painter in the world next week when or next month when you have Charlie. Um, <laughs> my God, that man. <laughs> he can paint so fast. And outside with like a huge, like huge canvas and blowing wind and like crazy stuff. Okay. Um I think that's mostly my darks. And if I scrape a bunch of it away, now I can start to get mids um, in there. Grasses in there, and there's a bunch of grasses and stuff over here. <laughs> okay. That one. Are you bored yet? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> so, when you're doing the lighter stuff, there's no white in there, it's just uh, thinner paint, okay? No, there's no white, no white anywhere yet. So I haven't, so the real, the, what the problems that I get into is that because here's my, here's the palette that I'm working from. I got a wet palette and normally I don't have that many colors on there, but because I was doing a bunch of different stuff this week, I kept throwing new colors in there. Normally my, my palette is really quite limited. Um, but the problem is because I have all these things out here, um, I start getting lazy or distracted before I get sort of my whole value thing in here. And then I start picking up the opaques, then I'm in trouble. So I really have to, to try and uh, keep my focus so that I don't start putting opaques in before, before I'm ready. So now I pretty much have, I'd say I pretty much have my darks most of my darks in. Um, so then I can either really water this down, David, don't be listening, and, um, and go in and, and get some of my, my mids. Um, which are going to be pretty Just a, they're pretty light, but I'm going to end up glazing over top. So um, I, I don't want them too dark because depending on how big my, my initial wash is, um, if, if they're too dark, then everything's going to end up dark once I put a, a layer of, um, of uh, glaze on there. Okay, what else do we got here? Okay, so, so as you held up your palette and you said you've used that most of the week, those colors look pretty pure yet. So you're mixing, can you, you're mixing on a piece of acetate or are you picking up with a different brush each time you're grabbing a new color? What are, am, how are you managing I'm, that? I am using this for paint storage only, right? I got a wet sponge under here. And yeah. Spraying it every now and again to keep it wet. Um, and, and then sometimes if this starts to dry out, then I spray underneath right to keep it. So I try and keep this as clean as possible. Once again, sometimes I lose it and I start mixing stuff over here and then it ends up not lasting. And then I have to get a new paper and do the whole thing again. But I am mixing, I am mixing on the plastic. Mm. Here you go. Okay. That, yeah. that is plastic. 
And then over here is glass. So if I have a lot of water in my paint, I mix on the glass because otherwise the water picks up little flecks of your dry paint underneath. And then you start getting these cruddy little bits of paint in your fresh paint. So, so I, this that I just mixed now had quite a bit of water in it, but I was on clean plastic. So I can just wipe this down and carry on and I won't have crud that I pick up. Um, but from now on in, I'm gonna mix the sloppy stuff on the glass and I'm gonna mix the non sloppy stuff on the plastic. I've just, that's just kind of works out for me or that's what I figured out in the last while since I started using, using the plastic. Before I started using this plastic, I, I used an even bigger piece of glass, like a huge piece of glass, which is actually really great to mix on, put a piece of white paper underneath it and then you can see the colors quite well. Um, a lot of people don't know what to do with the glass because they don't know how to clean it. Canadian Tire, these cost four bucks. Don't ever try and change the um, razors, just throw the thing out and get another one. Um, everybody I know has sliced their hand open at least once, me included. So, um, so you basically, you spray your, your dry paint on your glass with water and then it just slides right off. Never, you do, don't want to scrape it dry. It's, it, then you just get little flakes of stuff everywhere. Um, so that's, that's what I do. Okay, so now I'm going to put in, eh, that's probably, I haven't really thought about the background yet. On this one, I did, um, these are kind of the mountains around here. There's like a huge field. I took out a whole bunch of stuff. I took out the guy's barn and I took out the, um, the poles and the fencing and everything because I wanted it to be about the truck. And, um, ooh, light. Um, so this one here, I probably do sort of a similar mountains receding, probably make them lighter than that. Those are quite dark. Um, so that is how I start a painting. Um, and what time is it? Well, that was only 25 minutes. Just 25 minutes in, <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> What well, size of uh, canvas is that, Susie? 30 by 40. The, I paint a lot of big stuff. I do a lot of 36 by 48, 48 by 48, 48 by 60. Um, the big ones seem to sell quite well or small stuff like 12 by 16, 11 by 14, probably because those are more a lot more affordable. Um, I'm finding that all my, my in-between, 18 by 24, 20 by 24, um, 24 by 24, that type of stuff is a harder sell. It seems to be in no, in no man's land for, for what I'm, what I'm making, which is kind of weird. Okay. So we have lots of time. So let's, um, do some more. Maybe this will be, how do you start a painting and finish it in an hour and a half? Okay. Can you tilt the camera up just slightly? Perfect. Is that better? Yeah. Looking beautiful. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is, so I could go, okay, well maybe I'll show you something else. So maybe, so I could go in and um, take a neutral. Let's go mix opposites on the color wheel. We'll take some blue and some orange and we'll make a lovely neutral and some white. And we'll do a few of the mid-tones in more of an opaque. Okay. Just don't want it to be too uniform, like but that's very same, same, same. Um, so we'll end up having to um, 
muck that up. That's what that's the problem with with going in going in with the opaques is that that there's just not the variety that you get with with your transparents. Ah. You just get beautiful stuff with your with your transparents. It's just like the opaques just tend to give me mud, I think. Okay. Did you used to paint in watercolor? No, I've never painted in watercolor. I have uh, huh. really painted in anything, but I mean, I started painting 12 years ago and I, I figure I didn't really have enough time in my life because I'm not 20 anymore to, to um, be good at more than one medium. So I really haven't, I've, I've done um, oil plein air with just because that's better for outside. Um, but I, I, I really don't do a very good job of that. I can't really figure out how to do it. Because you kind of handle your acrylics like a watercolorist, right? I think it's just because they're trans, I think it's just the transparent. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, let's see. I think we got enough. I think we got enough variety here now. Let's see. All okay. right. Yeah, good enough. Okay, let's see. We got so you were saying at some point you put a glaze over the en entire canvas, do you? Yeah, I'm going to do that now because obviously we have lots of time. Dark, that's dark. That's yellow. Mm. All right. So now it has to be. It has to be really, really dry before putting a layer of anything on it. Hair dryer stuck. So now I'm gonna do this. This is gonna be. I'm gonna do this on the glass, just so that I don't make any little peely things in my um, Home Depot. Or actually, Lee Valley is the best place to get these. You can buy a bag, a bag full of them, of different different sizes and stuff, and then you can throw them away when they're actually they last forever. Um, this is transparent yellow oxide.
Okay, this is transparent red oxide. Oh, I'm going to add a little Quinn magenta. Um, a bigger brush. Susie, at some point, can you uh, tell us a little bit about why Brian Adio was such an influence or is such an influence with your painting? You know, when I, when I sold my businesses, I thought, oh God, what am I going to do? And um, so I was thinking about, oh, maybe I'd be a realtor or something like that. And then I, my sister's a realtor and I, I thought, oh my God, I can't do that. I don't actually want a job. I just want something to do. So... Um, I signed up for a workshop in Whistler and um, had no idea what I was signing up for. I just signed up for the first thing that came along and it turns out it was Brian Adio and, and it's the first time I'd ever painted and he was teaching an intermediate acrylic class and um, I showed up with all my stuff and um, he was just amazing like he's just an amazing amazing man like um this is water and um he he was just super encouraging and he's also incredibly knowledgeable like he's just a, a, he's just and i love the way he painted he's very very expressive and um yeah, I just, I just, so I took that class with him. I had no idea what I'd lucked into. And, and so after that, I, um, I sort of followed him and found out that he was teaching up at uh, Ursula's place. I don't know if any people, I'm sure some of your members have been to River Rock, which is Ursula um, and Rick's place up near Cochran, Alberta. And, um, so I went every year up there um, to go spend five days learning from him because I just like I like the way he teaches and I could understand what he was saying. I've taken a I took 31 workshops in the first three years I was painting and um, which is a bit obsessive, but it um, there were lots of people that I just didn't couldn't really relate to or I didn't feel like I learned much, but he was quite different.
Okay. So this is very Brian Adio-ish to for those of you that have taken a course from him. Boy, we're getting a lot of glare on that from these lights. Dirt. Just a sec. It's not, it's not bad at all, Susie. No, it's, it's pretty not, good. Not super glary on the No, it looks good. Okay. Looks good. Um so then so that um, messy glaze or wash, whatever you want to call it, um, you could do with one color. You could do, I used four because I wanted variety. Um, you could use purple. Um, who's it? There's one workshop I took once and a guy used um, purple and uh God, I couldn't deal with it, but um, he made beautiful paintings with, I spent the whole time trying to cover the purple up. Um, but here I, I should still have, um, be able to see the values, what is gonna be light, what's gonna be mid, what's dark. Um, keeping in mind that I'm not quite sure what I'm gonna do with the background yet. Um, but say you go in and you've, and like here, this is a bit washed, washed out and I don't really like what's going on there. I could just go back in with what I got going here and, um, and put some more color in there. Or, and, and the whole thing is quite, is very warm, which also unifies it. So this is my underpainting. So now I can go back in and put use use opaques um, and use neutrals I can put new see what happened with these neutrals here like the, the gray that I put in there and the gray that I put in here um, it's got a ton of variety now um, but let me give you an example so let's see this truck is usually I go from here and I go and re put in some of my darks because once you put, especially if you put the trans yellow oxide on top, your darks are going to get a little bit lighter. So if I wanted, this is pretty dark, but if I wanted some darker darks, um, I could figure out where I want those and go back in and put some darker darks in. That's going to be pretty dark. Um, but I probably go from here and I just sort of pick a section. Um, let's see, let's go with, um, okay, we'll go with some of the mids on these. Um, these are in the shadow, um, but they're like gray. It's a bit of a purpley, purpley gray. And I have to decide how much of what's there am I gonna am I gonna cover up. If you've got all this great variety in here, um, it's really easy to go and and cover it all up and then wonder why you put that great layer in there. Um, if you end up covering up too much of it then you can just like I could let that dry, throw a bit of glaze on top of it and then get that variety back again. It's a bit purple, that color. So we'll give it some yellow ochre. So is that, is, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, so I was just gonna ask when you do your glazing, are you using any medium or anything there or are you just taking it right out of the tube? Um, no, it's just paint. It's just paint and um, water. If if I used medium with it, it would get sticky, and it right. it wouldn't run the same. Um, and yeah. And you're not using fluid paints. You're using the heavy body. Yep, they're heavy body. I. 
I buy, like there's my trans red oxide. I, I tend to buy everything in tubs this big. That way I um, don't chintz out on the paint. Like you really have to use a lot of paint. Like, you know, Brian's favorite saying I think is, put lots of paint on so that you can take lots of paint off. So if you get lots on there, you can actually wipe stuff off and create patterns. If you don't put enough on there, it will be dry so fast, you'll have nothing to wipe off and, and, and everything will be thin. Um, so this, the mess that I make on my um, palette is pretty, there's a lot of paint on there. I waste or use a lot of paint, but I just figure it's the cost of doing business. And the easiest way to use a lot of paint is buy big tubs of paint. If you, if you um, don't want to spend the money on golden, um, a lot of the chroma paints um, from Granville Island are really good. Um, I don't use all of them, but I use some of them. And they cost, oh God, a third of what golden costs. Like, and they'll ship. I just got a box full of stuff the other day. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good way to go it to, as far as buying paint locally goes. Does anybody buy, use chroma paint? Yes. 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 <laughs> Very fluid. Yeah. <We> <laughs> It is. Yeah, they're nice and creamy. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't care. I don't care um, for their white that much for whatever reason. But um, their 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 Quinburnt Orange is is really great. It's not called Quinburnt Orange. It's called um, has a different name, but it's but it looks exactly like Quinburnt Orange. And um, I use a lot of. Um, that which is, um, it, it's Stevenson's Cad Yellow Deep. And of course, Stevenson has gone out of business. And so it's impossible to find Cad Yellow Deep that's that dark. Um, and Chroma makes a dialeride or aeralide yellow, which is the closest I've found to... Um, to the Stevenson um, uh, Cad Yellow Deep. So what I'm gonna do here is try and, when I'm putting, say, my yellow in on, on this truck here on its little yellow vertical piece, is I, I'm, I wanna try and leave some of the underpaint coming through so that I'm just not painting a straight yellow, um, blob on there is because if I do that, then I'm going to have to go back in and, and muck it up, muck it up again. But you can go and get your ride here. There's my, um, so that's what I would do. So now I'm just going to start going in and putting my local color in on top of this underpainting, trying to utilize as much of these things that I have underneath. At the end of the day, most of that's going to be covered. And, and you'd go, oh, man, I, I just love this little section here. Well, you know what? You're going to have to give it up. And maybe a bit of it will show up. But chances are you're going to cover most of it. But a lot of what's underneath here will, will influence um, what the painting looks like in the very end. Because even there will be tiny little bits showing through that give you um, nice variety. And then I'm always conscious of my values and I go and often take, well, before it goes anywhere, I'll take photos of it. If I find I can judge the best what's going on in my camera as opposed to looking at it. So I'll take a photo of it, look at it in my camera and go, oh, well, that's too dark, that's too light, that's too warm, that's too cool, that's too saturated, or that's too neutral. And then I adjust from there. And with acrylic paint, it is really, really easy to, so I've decided, say I've put a whole bunch of neutral gray in there and I've decided that it's just all too flat. So I can take um, a little 
um, of my yellow and put some muck on top of that and then go back in with my gray again. So nothing in this painting is very precious. I'm pretty happy to, you know, and if I wanted some color in here, I could take that that's going to pop through too. I could take say some orange and um, do something like that. You go, Oh my God, that's terrible. Um, and, and then go paint over that. And I may have little hits of orange that pop through, or even you could, it's good to do that actually with um, cad red or cad red light also it does nice things. Um, you can do it with any color. And then once you paint your stuff over top of it, there may be bits. So I don't want that red to, to be that, but I might want a bit of it. So we'll do that. Let's do a little bit more in the dark. Susie, if you were doing a non-objective, an abstract, would you start your painting in the same way? I have no idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably not. I don't, I don't really know. Like I, I don't have a system at all for non-objective stuff because most of the non-objective work that I've done has been stuff that I've learned from Brian um, that, that's been, you know, 30 different ways to paint non-objective stuff. And so uh, some things turn out really, really well. And then I'll make five or six of them try and do a series. And then other stuff is just horrific. So um, I think with non-objective, I don't, I don't have a voice with non-objective, put it that way, with my boats and the bears. And in theory, you should be able to look at them and say, oh, I think Susie made that. But with my non-objective, oh God, it could be anybody that made it because I'm all over the place. I don't really, I don't think I have a voice when it comes to that. So. But you, you, you'd probably start it with transparency. I probably would, I probably would, yes. I, I yeah. probably start everything with, I, I do start pretty much everything with transparency. Um, okay. Um, I have, but you could do, the same thing with black gesso, right? You could, you could do a value um, start like this with black gesso, a um, lot of gestural marks and you can water it down, which of course you'll probably lose all the binding in it then, but, um, or wipe it um, to get a mid or, um, and then, and use your black gesso as your value um, start and then go and do glazes and, and then carry on from there. So um, with, with these four colors, um, they, in theory, they, these, this could all just be black gesso, but you can see that there's a bit too much, there's a lot of color in here, like blue and green and stuff, even, even with the mm -hmm. Anyway. Does anybody have any questions? I uh, watched a video recently on uh, YouTube and it was somebody demoing an acrylic painting. And this person said that you shouldn't dilute your acrylics and, and with water to do your washes because it then it loses the binding, uh, whatever, and it makes it bind to the next layer that you should actually be using a medium instead of water. Um, what do you think about that? That is true. It depends on how much water you use. Um, if, if it's really, really sloppy, um, then, then you can't, I've never had any trouble with it. And I, I think, and I don't think Brian's had any trouble with it and he's done it, well, he's painted now probably for 60 years, but, um, but I think that you do, you definitely do have to be careful. One of the things you, I've, I've experimented a little bit and Chroma, their, um, 
clear acrylic medium is really runny. Like it's like normally I use Liquitex. The Chroma stuff is super runny, um, but it still is acrylic resin. So it would have good binding properties and be pretty runny and probably function a bit more like water. So I have used this sometimes, but I just have to be way more careful because it gets, it, it, it operates a little bit different and it gets a bit stickier. So you just really have to learn how to use it. So if you're worried about that, I would use this instead and, and see how that works for you. Does that add a glare to your painting? I find that the mediums, they add glare. Well, I prefer using water because you don't get a glare and then you don't get value change. Yeah, but that doesn't, at the end of the day, at the end of your painting, that doesn't actually matter. All of your paints have different glare to them. Like your transparents are way more shiny than your opaques. So when you finish a painting, you're going to have areas that are glossier and more matte anyway. So mm -hmm. I counteract that by my top coat is a Robert Ginn formula, which is a third matte medium, a third gloss medium, and a third water. So I <laughs> mix it in my little um, jar of gloss medium, matte medium, water, and then you don't want to shake it because you don't want bubbles in it. And then it's got a really lovely consistency. And I put that on with a big brush as my top coat at the very end. And sometimes I do two top coats. So if I want my painting to be even more matte than I do, I just change my ratio of gloss to matte keeping your third water, but change your ratio of gloss to matte and then just make it a bit more satin so it's not shiny and it'll even out all your inconsistencies. So I don't worry about it till the very end. And that sort of solves, that solves the, that solves the issue. Hmm. Um, Golden has, uh, you know, the Golden does a lot of uh, actual testing and things like that. Yeah. And they have a really good resource on their website called Just Paint. And they did an article about two years ago and they tested their paint diluted up to 100 uh, water to one part of paint, which is really dilute. I mean, by that time you're talking about a slight tea stain. And uh, there was one pigment and I forget which one it was. It was one of the yellows that had uh, an adhesion problem at that level. But I mean, you'd never put a hundred parts water into one part of paint. So basically they have reversed their, um, what they are saying about adding water to their acrylic. They're now saying, hey, you know, go for it, it's fine. And uh, they've done the testing to back that up. Oh, that's interesting. Um, it's, no. it's deceptive when I put that sloppy layer on there because I, I used a lot of paint, like I, picked up like big gobs with that little or with that brush. So, and there was water in it for sure. And certainly there was water when I splashed it on there, but there was a lot of paint on there. And there was an area, can't remember where, I think it was over here that had more water in it than any, anywhere else. And you can, and it, and it acted completely different. It got it. it and when you wipe it, it's, it's kind of nondescript. Like this is a lot more interesting here. And there was way more paint here and less water. Here was more water, which was not great. I, I would probably reglaze this section right here. The other thing, if you're worried about that adhesion, you could put an isolation coat on this of, of this mix, um, which is pretty thin. Just lay this flat and then just do an isolation coat, which would really bind that, I believe. And then you could carry on if you were worried about that. So any other questions? You can ask me anything about whatever. Galleries, painting, my studio. Do you want to see well, when do you uh, When do you start to put in the lights? Um, I could put in the lights now. Um, let's see. 
Well, actually, I would put the mids and then and then the lights because I'm going to go dark. I'm going to go dark to light. But if I really wanted to, sometimes it's nice to have the range right in there at the beginning. So if you have something like this, just a sec, I'm going to put in my lightest light right now. Okay, I'm just going to put some there in a sec. Just so that I now have a range to work with so that when I go and put some thing that I think is, is a light and it's not that light, I'm like, oh, it's too dark. It's not that light. Plus when you do a range and I've got my darkest, my darkest dark and my lightest light, it's easy to fill stuff in in between and not worry about putting a light somewhere and going, oh, I think that's too light. I think that's too light because you've already got it there and it, it feels safer to work within these um, two ranges. And um, it's just easier to be brave with, with, pushing, with pushing your values from lightest light to darkest dark. So, so sometimes I do that, but chances are I would work, probably tweak the darks so that I have the darkest darks where I want them. And then I would go in and do a lot of mid, a lot of my mid tones um, because I tend to um, neglect those as so I've been told. So I, I make sure that I get all my mids in and then the mid tones tend to be the ones that I put in and I reglaze part of, put back in, reglaze part of. Um, the, the lightest lights are really easy to, they're easier to do. Um, but, but it's, it's a push and pull because I'm going to put stuff in, I'm going to glaze part of it, but not all of it. And then I'm going to put something else in, then I'm going to pull it back then I'm going to, you know, tweak it, make it warmer, make it cooler. Um, yeah. When you say you're going to reglaze, are you using the same glazes, like the same colors again? Um, not necessarily. I really like, um, green gold. So I'll probably, and I haven't used any green gold yet, um, so I probably will use that somewhere too. But um, of my transparents, um, the, my four transparents that I started with, I'll use those. Um, I'll, so my palette for making this would be um, titanium white, transparent yellow oxide, yellow ochre, um, a lemon yellow or a light yellow, cool yellow, um, cad yellow deep, cad orange, cad red light, quin magenta, which is my one of my dark transparents, transparent red oxide, my other dark transparent, my phthalo green, my phthalo blue. And then I also use ultramarine just because it's it's great for the it's great for the background and I'll introduce it in here so that it's not just in the background because then it'll look foreign you kind of have to have all your colors everywhere um, and that and that would be it um, I'm gonna make all my neutrals from opposites on the color wheel um, so that they're richer I do have a pre-mixed dark that I often use um, which is a combination of which I, um, which is a combination of my four, um, you can't see in there, but the phthalo blue, phthalo green, anyway, those four dark transparents, um, and it makes a deep, deep bluish black. And, um, and I, I've run out, but I pre-mix that and I often use that for my darkest dark. Um, it also mixed with white makes a really nice dark, dark blue that isn't too bright. It's quite muted, um, which I probably used in that background, mixed white with it. 
on the little study. Um, so that's kind of my color palette. And after, usually with each different painting, I like to throw in one extra color of something else, just so that I don't get stuck on those. It's boring painting with the same colors all the time, but I like to keep my palette quite limited. Otherwise I start making color mistakes. So I'll, I'll throw one new color in there like cobalt teal or oh, green gold or just something else to mix it up depending on what I'm making. If I do marine stuff, I'll usually throw cobalt teal in there. Um, if I'm doing bears, I'll usually add raw sienna uh, quin or quinburnt orange. Um, so it depends on, on what I'm making. Is anything else? Do so I see your, is your little bitty one you painted in a similar way that you showed us your study? Yep. That so that gives us a sense of where you end up. That's, that's, that's sort of, that's sort of where we're going to end up. I think the foreground's a bit busy with all that grass. I probably will have some patches of calm in there. So it's not all grass like that. Um, I might make the background and the mountains a bit lighter. I'm not really sure. Like it, I don't really know exactly where I'm going. Uh, and I, I might make this one rustier, like put more rust on the fenders. Not sure. I, I don't, I don't, I, I start with a bit of an idea, but I don't, um, I don't necessarily, I don't stick to it. I sort of change things as I go along um, and see and see what see what happens. Kind of got to be brave and and just throw some things in there and see what happens. It's acrylic paint; you can always cover it up, right? It's easy to easy to fix things. So, okay, do you want to? I'll show you my studio here. So I'm quite spoiled. So. Um, oh, let me see. There's the entrance. And that's, um, I started a cat series for COVID with the toilet paper. Oh, and, um, <laughs> that's adorable. It's not, it's not funny. So I've drawn out five or six and I'm going to do some more. This is a bear commission that is going, it's in plastic, that's going to um, Whistler. And then um, stuff, I have um, a lot of storage. I have a storage room in there and a bathroom over there. And then a kitchen. And here we are back at where we were painting. So when we moved up here from Whistler, we're quite isolated. We're 17 kilometers out of Pemberton. So my husband built this big, huge studio so that I wouldn't want to move back to Whistler. So. <laughs> that's, that's pretty, that's pretty good. I, I can kind of see where that's kind of like your dream studio. Yeah, well, and you, you, um, uh, you before COVID, you were holding workshops for uh, for people up there. Yeah, I can easily put ten people in here. Um, I've got killer lighting system with um, like twelve of those giant tubes up there. So no matter where you are in the room, the lighting is good. Um, I can easily put ten people in here, and so Brian comes, like I said, once a year. Um, so hopefully he'll be back next year. Um, and then, and then I do some classes like three days. Um, I do my favorite class to teach is a boot camp, which is a series of fast exercises, like multitude of exercises through the day, um, on brush strokes, color mixing, value, whatever, um, timed things. And, uh, but I find that I have so much stuff in here now that for me to run a class, I have to do a lot of cleaning up and moving stuff around. So 
Um, I tend to go places and teach somewhere else so I can just show up, teach, and then go home again. And uh, so I, other than Brian coming, I haven't taught here in a few years. Yes. Just because it's, 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 it's harder. And I don't really do it for the money because I, it's better to paint and sell paintings. So, um, mm. so it, I'd like to just go travel. I mean, I, last one I taught was I think for Dean and Dean Croft in North Van. Mm. But then with COVID, I haven't been anywhere. So I haven't been anywhere in a year. <laughs> been, you, you people <laughs> been anywhere in a year. It's getting a bit boring. What are some of your art habits? Like with a studio like that, do you find that you kind of like make it a habit or you're in there five days a week and you paint for a certain number of hours and then you might do some sketching, you might watch some videos, you might make yourself something to eat? <laughs> I used to come out here and do 10 hours, 12 hours and go, God, I'm hungry. It's five o'clock. Um, but I seem to have gotten lazier or something. And so now I come over here at 830 and I would paint till four or five. Um, stop for lunch, of course. But now I tend to come over here at 830. I paint for three or four hours. Then I go have lunch. And now that the weather's good, um, we have, we're on 50 acres. And I have a huge garden and yards and stick picking and stuff. So, um, so then I tend to go out in the yard in the afternoon. I paint a little bit less in the summer once the weather gets good. In the winter, I'll just paint all day. But I paint five or six days a week. Like mm. I, even if I sneak over here for two or three hours, I'm in here pretty much every single day. I've, I've found COVID to be very demotivating. Like it's hard for me. I had a, I had a couple of months where I pretty much produced nothing, and and I watched a lot of YouTube videos on dog rescue in California, <laughs> <laughs> and I had to pull out of that and um, pull it pull it back together. So I'm fine now, but it's uh, you know it's 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 hard to be um, as motivated with without the the workshops and, and just the social, the social interaction and going to the city, going to the fed, seeing what everybody else is doing. Um, and, or just, um, I have a three or four girlfriends that we would always paint one day a week together and we haven't done that in a year. And so, um, it's, I, I find that I, I'm way more social than I thought I was with, with art. And so I do love to spend a whole day painting, but, um, I really miss everybody. Um, so I can't wait till we can get back to everybody painting together. I think it's going to go crazy once we can paint together. Everybody's going to be socializing. So does anybody uh, have any uh, questions for Susie on anything? Go for it. No, but well, as soon as you want to come out, you better come up. <laughs> yeah let me know I mean I like that boot camp class is so much fun like it's it's really it's challenging it's kind of an intermediate level class but if you're a beginner and then you don't mind winging it it's then it's for everybody um and, and it's just really a lot of fun so but I mean I've taught regular classes on on um on um how to, you know, on boat paintings or animals or whatever, but I prefer to, I prefer to do the boot camp just because it's, I think it's the most fun. It sounds like fun. It really sounds like a lot of fun. Do you have information online then, Susie, for your boot camp and other classes? No, no, I haven't put, I haven't put anything on there. Well, because of COVID. Yeah. Everything just stopped. I did, I did have stuff on there for the last class I did was at Dean's. And so he had info, but um, I mean, if you want info, I can pull up um, sort of the stuff that I sent out to people that had signed up. Um, yeah. so if you just fire me an email, I will, I'll send you the attachment and you can see what it is. Okay. Um, yeah. Feel free. I'll just, I'll just send stuff out and eventually, eventually we'll, we'll get there. 
maybe we'll all be vaccinated by September. Well, I sure hope so. I've got granddaughters out in Pemberton, so and they're fin they're finished um, school, and one's in art in Victoria, UVic now, and so I didn't know. I don't know if she even knows about your classes, but What's it would be fun to take something together with my granddaughters. Yeah, wouldn't that, that would be fun. I've had I've had a number of mom and daughter classes. They yeah, good bonding. Yeah, that's I'm looking for something like that. So that would be fabulous. Yeah, that would be good. Awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody have anything else? We have I think we have time. Yeah, we have time. When do you usually finish? Uh, anywhere between 830 and nine, just depending on on the uh, subject or whatever it happens to be. I wonder I have if you ever, oh, sorry. I wonder if you ever like uh, glaze or ground your canvas first. I know you started on a white canvas and just uh, with your subject matter, but do you ever um, start just, you know, putting color on your canvas and then going in with your darks? No, I don't. Oh, I, I used to because the very first class I, well, the second class I took was with Janice Robertson. Janice used to always tone her canvas with Quinn Gold, right? You'd Quinn Gold your thing, and then you'd off you'd go. And so I did that for for a long time because that was what I learned. And um, but no, I, I tend not to. I um, I find it easier to draw on the on the on the white. Then I can get my drawing right. Uh, it, I find it. Re Ooh, don't drink cat. Drink the dirty water. Um, <laughs> It's just bad. Um, I find it too distracting to to draw on on top of that. I suppose I could draw on something that wouldn't rub off, right? When you put the when you put the that, that glaze on. But no, I like the. I don't know. I that's just the way I've I've done it now. Mm -hmm. The cool start. I like it. It's uh, it's kind of it's fun and brave. It's good. <laughs> it it makes you not hold anything in there as precious because you flopped all this stuff all over it. And then, and then you just have to see what you get and then start working with that. And if something's too dark, you just make it lighter, put another layer on it and, um, and adjust all your values and, and carry on. Cool. Yeah. Anybody else? Maybe you could send that, uh, list to Kit or something that so that she could just share it with all of us so we don't you don't get a ton of emails from everybody right I can um I can post it with the video uh yeah. which would be probably uh you know handy okay mm -hmm. perfect Susie I wondered has your uh did your physiotherapy inform your art at all um in theory, I should be a really good figurative or portrait painter because I know the body so well, um, but I'm not. Um, mostly because I just never went to life drawing like I should have. And, um, and I don't know, I, uh, but I think, I think for seeing things, probably my observation skills are pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. But I've always liked art. I've always you know, and I've always been a very visual person. I've learned that I'm a terrible listener and I really do not learn verbally. Like, I mean, it's a problem in our house. Um, like I, I never have. And, and so I've, I think I've had this all along just with having to go to school and take sciences and then go to university and then be a physio and then have 50 employees and do that for 30 years. You, there is no time to do any art. I, and I think that I always wanted to, but I don't know that it just didn't work out like that till, till now. So hmm. think about that. Man, I just think how good I could have been if I had a <laughs> when I was 20. <laughs> I didn't have no money, you know? <laughs> you know, you. And I mean, that was a great career to have. I really, I really did love it, but it wasn't very creative, but it was still rewarding um, in, in many, many ways. So, you know, you know, I get to do this now. So that's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to catch up. Mm -hmm. 
Anything else? Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Susie. That was wonderful. We really appreciate your time tonight and thank you everybody for coming out. Um, yeah, I, I hope everyone has a great month here. We'll look forward to seeing you next uh, in, at our May meeting and uh, yeah, happy painting everybody. Okay, well, thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much again, Susie. Bye. Thanks.